The next item of business is a debate on motion S5M14720 in the name of Colin Smith on the ScotRail break clause. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and call on Colin Smith to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Today, Parliament has a chance to put Scotland's rail passengers before the profits of our privatised rail firms. To say to commuters, we are listening, that we will not sit idly by on the sidings where passengers suffer from a railway system where fares are rising above wages, where new trains run late before they've even been built, where passengers stand on a platform not yet convinced the train will even stop, and if it does, will it be late or overcrowded? Labour's starting point in this debate is to be clear about what our railways are for, to connect people and goods to support a vibrant economy and thriving society. Now, that may seem obvious, but the reality is, under the fragmented, privatised rail system we have today, public transport has become detached from public service. Our trains should be essential services, but instead they are being used simply as an opportunity for profit by private companies. That's until the private firm fail and the government has to step in. And stepping in to end Abelio's mismanagement of the current ScotRail franchise is exactly what this SNP government needs to do. Because in every measure, On every measure of performance within this franchise, punctuality, cancellations, capacity, it's a case of fail, fail, fail. In fact, we currently have the worst performance since this franchise began. On punctuality, ScotRail haven't met their targets since 2015. Performance is now so bad, it has hit breach level, or rather it would have been a breach of the franchise had the Cabinet Secretary not struck a backroom deal in September to give ScotRail a licence to fail until June next year. Paul Wheelhouse. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention. I'll keep this brief. Would the member accept that uh, data that have been provided by ScotRail in advance of this debate show that in the period since the start of this financial year, 63% of the faults have been responsibility of Network Rail? Colin Smith. I mean, we could, we, could, we could pass the buck as the Minister clearly wants to do. We could talk about, we could talk about the fact that contained within, contained within those figures for Network Rail, contained within those figures for Network Rail are disruption caused entirely by extreme weather. Now, they don't show up in the Scott Rail figures, they show up in the no Network Rail figures. Now, maybe it's a position of Paul Wheelhouse that we can make the weather better under an SNP devolved administration. I don't know. But what we should be doing... What we should be doing, what we should be doing is not frankly letting Scott Rail off the hook. Because when we did let Scott Rail off the hook, what is it they did? The following month, they delivered an even worse performance report during the reporting period with the annual average public performance measure failing to its lowest point since 2006. By the company's own admission, it will be 2019 before the performance increases just to scrape above breach level. And according to the Office of Road and Rail's most recent projections, Scott Rail are unlikely to hit their performance targets until sometime in 2022, although Scott Rail refused to say if they will. That's six years without hitting a single franchise punctuality target, six years of failure on this government's watch. And this plummeting performance isn't limited to punctuality. The ORR also found that reliability in the first quarter of this year was the worst since records began, and it's getting worse. Cancellations are skyrocketing, with the cancellation rate for the last reporting period more than three times higher, yes, three times higher than it was at the same time in the first two years of the franchise, leaving more and more of Scotland's passengers stranded. And the trains that do run are increasingly likely to be overcrowded, with the moving annual average for capacity hitting a franchise low in the last reporting period. Improving punctuality, reliability and capacity year on year should be the basic aims of any franchise. But under this franchise, after one failed improvement plan and the publication of a second, all three performance measures are getting worse. And it's not just in their franchise performance obligations that ScotRail are failing. On every key responsibility, from service quality to rolling stock management, this franchise is a shambles. Squire, the service quality incentive regime, monitors the state of trains and stations across a range of measures. Cleanliness, safety, accessibility and staffing, crucial parts of any successful franchise are all monitored by this scheme. That monitoring shows that ScotRail haven't hit more than half of their Squire targets since 2016 and at points they hit 
less than a quarter. Last year, they failed in so many measures, the only thing they delivered was record fines of more than four and a half million pounds. And again, things are getting worse. This year alone, ScotRail have already racked up more than two million pounds worth of fines for failing to hit their Squire targets, the highest ever for this point in the year. The management of rolling stock has been equally shambolic. The long-awaited 385 class trains from Hitachi were delivered 10 months late, and then they were almost immediately recalled for safety reasons. The so-called iconic refurbished intercity 125s, which ScotRail said would transform rail travel in Scotland, are being rolled out without controlled emission tanks fitted. Yes, in 2018, this franchise is reintroducing on ScotRail services trains whose toilets will quite literally be emptied directly onto the tracks, despite a clear agreement not to do so. It's a shocking practice as outdated as the 40-year-old trains themselves. And it really does show utter contempt for communities and staff working on those tracks whose health and safety will be compromised as a result. Yet it's clear from the government's amendment today that none of this matters. They'll continue to wring their hands, they'll say it isn't very good, but when it comes to the crunch, it will be business as usual. Presiding officer, this government needs to wake up to the fact this is a failing franchise operating within a failing franchising model. It's a symptom of the fragmented, profit-driven, sorry, I don't have time. It's a symptom of the fragmented, profit-driven, privatised railway system created 25 years ago this month. A privatisation experiment that needs to be driven to the end of the track. And here in Scotland today, we can take a first step towards doing just that. There's a break clause in the ScotRail franchise that could simply be allowed to expire in 2022 rather than be extended to 2025. The government has the power to use that clause to put Scotland's passengers and for that matter Abelio out of their misery and end this franchise. By seven notice now it gives the government time to put in place a public sector operator of last resort and to properly prepare a public sector bid should there be any future franchising. Because from their decision not to directly award the Northern Irons Ferry contract to the public sector to the timid transport bill which keeps the ban preventing local councils fully running bus services, this government are at best ambivalent towards public ownership of public transport, which is why they will not enforce that clause today. The Scottish Government, if they were committed to public ownership, would end this franchise at the earliest opportunity. They would get serious about a public sector bid. They would recognise that ultimately what we need is an end to the wasteful, inefficient franchising system altogether. So they would back Labour's calls for the repeal of the 1993 Railways Act so we can have proper public ownership of our railways, bringing track and train together, not the current failed separation of network rail and rail operators. But, President Officer, even those who do not support public ownership in the Chamber today must see that the current franchise is just not working and has to end sooner rather than later. So when it comes to the vote later day, today, members will have a choice. A choice between putting passengers first or continuing to put the profits of the privatised utilities first by allowing this franchise to continue. And moving the motion, in my name, President Officer, Labour is clear whose side we are on. Labour is on the side of Scotland's passengers, the rail staff, the trade unions, who together say enough is enough. It's time to call a halt to this franchise. It's time to end privatisation. <laughs> Now call Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and move Amendment 14720.3 for up to six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has been clear in our ambition to ensure Scotland's railways deliver a world-class service across the country. Our record investment of £5 billion to March 2019 will deliver the outcomes of connecting communities, enabling opportunities and spreading sustainable economic prosperity across Scotland. And the ScotRail franchise is now well into its fourth year under the stewardship of Abilio. Now, the Chamber is fully aware that there continues to be significant challenges in both Network Rail and ScotRail's ability to meet the Government's challenging but achievable service performance targets, and the amendment in my name acknowledges this. However, it's also very important not to lose sight of the significant improvements that ScotRail has already delivered, and of the further transfer transformational improvements this contract is on the cusp of delivering for Scotland. The upgrade and expansion of the rolling stock used in Scotland is well underway and the passengers across the central belt have already been able to travel on the new Class 385 train since July. Around 100 new electric carriages have been added to the ScotRail fleet this year, 
enabling the main Edinburgh to Glasgow uh, route to be a fully electric railway since August. These faster, greener and longer el electric trains have already replaced the 48 diesel carriages each hour between our two main cities and so will contribute to delivery of low emission zones and achieving our low carbon transport targets. We know that the introduction of these trains has not been without problems and the Scottish Government has made clear its disappointment with Hitachi's late delivery. Nonetheless, passenger feedback for those that, who have travelled on them has been strongly positive since they've been introduced by ScotRail. I know that members across the Chamber, including Jamie Green, John Finney, John Mason, have been impressed by the modern onboard facilities, more seats, improved accessibility and overall better travel experience. And ScotRail deserves credit because when faced with Hitachi's delayed delivery, ScotRail secured and introduced 40 available electric carriages. I've only six minutes, uh, so I'm afraid I'll have to pass just now. Uh, and introduce. I'm going to make progress, Mr Finlay, if you don't mind, and introduce 40 available electric carriages to ensure an electric service with enough seats until it actually delivers the full new fleet, putting passengers first. So these solutions have maintained service provision and increased capacity with more than 17,200 extra seats already provided each day on Edinburgh to Glasgow services. Not that Colin Smith acknowledged that. As we move towards... All 70 of the new train sets being delivered by next spring. More trains will be able to enter service on our newly electrified network, which is part of our five billion investment in the railway across Scotland. This will deliver significant improvements to routes from uh, Stirling, Dunblane and Alloway in December, and also then the Edinburgh Glasgow Central via Shots route from May 2019. The new fleet will also provide more seats on existing routes, such as North Berwick, Lanark and Glasgow uh, South Electrics to in turn allow a further cascading of existing refurbished trains to other routes. Overall, this will boost seating by 23% since the start of the franchise. Of course, we want to do more, and in the next few weeks, another 200 extra services will be introduced across the country to make rail travel more attractive for commuters and leisure users and to help boost the wider Scottish economy. Labour may not be interested in this, but you might want to listen. ScotRail has recruited more frontline uh, staff. Could we have a but quiet, please. ScotRail has Minister. recruited more frontline staff to deliver these enhancements, with 126 more posts now than at the start of this franchise, with a further 140 being recruited. Edina now provides a total of more than 5,000 jobs, and the rolling stock which is needed will be freed up by the, the Class 385s and refurbished high speed trains entering service in the coming months. The Cascade will not only help support new services, it will also enable more trains in Fife, the Borders, Inverclyde and Glasgow to run with more carriages and boost the total number of carriages in the ScotRail fleet to more than 1,000. Presiding officer, that is an increase of more than 50% since 2007. And while Colin Smith and his colleagues might not recognise it, ScotRail is delivering its revolution in rail for passengers across the entire Scottish rail network. Indeed, growing numbers of passengers use the ScotRail franchise, uh, continuing, well, thank you, if you, if you won't mind, continuing the constant growth and patronage throughout the life of this government. We have consistently stated in this chamber that performance is not where it should be and have reiterated to both ScotRail and Network Rail the need for a robust and resilient plan to deliver improvements across the network and provide customers with a more reliable railway. Although ScotRail remains one of the best performing large train operators in Great Britain, with the moving average, uh, annual average of ScotRail's public performance measure 1.9% better than the GB average, clearly the deterioration in performance needs to stop in order to return reliability and punctuality to our challenging but achievable targets. The recommendations contained in the Donovan Review aim to support performance improvement and deliver a resilient railway are welcome, but we are yet to see these improvements take effect. However, we recognise that the suspension of the practice of skip-stopping services at stations to recover operations has been welcomed by passengers, with skip-stopping now at the lowest level on record. I'll take a brief intervention. Colin Smith, very briefly. The, the Minister said um, that we need to improve performance. Could you tell the Chamber today when ScotRail will actually hit the performance targets? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, Mr Smith is, is not failing, he's failing to, to note the improvement that's been made. The skip-stopping is down 84% in the last year. Uh, the, the move has also been welcomed by Transport Excuse Focus. me, Minister. Thank you. Could I ask people to stop shouting from a seated position, please, and recognise that if we're going to get through this debate, we're very, very pushed for time. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If I may, I know time is short. I want to point out, to, in the absence of positivity from Mr Smith, a very recent statement by the Convener of Scottish Borders Council, David Parker, 
who has recognised the, pos the positive engagement of ScotRail in maximising the benefits of this government's investment in providing rail services to residents of Midlothian and the central borders. Councillor Park Parker states, I've been very impressed with the team at Abelio ScotRail who have worked very hard to make the Borders Railway a success and are continuing to focus on improvements. And importantly, Transport Scotland and Abelio ScotRail deserve credit for managing the enormous investment that is taking place in Scotland's railways at the moment. And for passengers, the benefits of these improvements will be felt very strongly in the year ahead. Perhaps if Councillor Parker uh, can recognise it, not even in this chamber, perhaps Mr Smith might do that in the future. But as the Parliament will be aware, 63% of the delays in our railways are the responsibility of Network Rail. Timetabling has been centralised in Milton Keynes. There have been issues with vehicles being left on the track. It is not just about weather, Mr Smith, You'll you might want to dig into to the detail. Close, please, and I know I need to come to conclusion, Presiding Officer. I thank you for your patience. Uh, I will pick up some other points in closing, but I wish Mr Smith and his colleagues would give some credit to the staff and, and management of ScotRail for the improved performance they are delivering for our passengers. Would you like to move your amendment, please, Minister? Oh, sorry, I formally <laughs> moved the amendment. Point of order, Lane Smith. Once I get a microphone, thank you. I wonder, Presiding Officer, if you might tell us what standing orders say about the uh, Scottish Government completely ignoring the terms of the substantive motion regarding the break clause. It is uh, up to individual members how they respond in the chamber and what they say. And can I say to everyone involved, perhaps if I could have heard everything that was being said since the start of the debate, it may be easier to answer that question. And I call on Jamie Green to speak to and move Amendment 14720.2 for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deb's Brow, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if... I mean, does Mr. Wheelhouse really believe what he was reading out on that speech? Because passengers out there watching this debate will be wondering uh, what planet he's living on. The reality is that, the, the, the reality is, well, I, no, I, let me make some progress first. Well, okay, if you can answer that question, that would be great. Paul Wheelhouse. I, I, I do, as somebody who believes in using official statistics, yes, I do believe in these statistics, but also as someone who uses trains, I can see the improvement. Mr. Green himself has acknowledged it on Twitter, social media, the improvement in the rolling stock. Perhaps he would acknowledge that today. Jamie Green. Right, so we've got new, new rolling stock. I've been on them, great carriages. But that does not in any way account for the many problems that people are facing right across, across Scotland. People standing on platforms, waiting on the train. The train goes whooshing by. What, what's the new carriage going to do for them? People on crowded trains that can't get a seat. What's the new carriage going to do for them when there are no seats available? What about the commuters this morning on the Larbert to Croy track who saw floodwaters not on the track but coming through the roof of their train? What's the rolling stock go going to, to do to support those people? I I'm afraid the, the, the lack of self-awareness from the Minister is quite incredible in today's motion. And for that reason, to be fair, I've got a lot of sympathy for the sentiment of what uh, Labour's point is today and the point they're making uh, with their amendment uh, because, because what they're doing is forcing to the Chamber an important point about the performance. The performance in the status quo is simply unacceptable to passengers at the moment. Please let me make some progress. But I do want to explain, and, and I think this is why the, the member uh, wants to intervene, I do want to explain why we won't support the motion, because I think it's important, if I may, I think it's important to explain why. Uh, first of all, what Labour uh, motions today is asking us to end the uh, current contract at its earliest opportunity. Now, presumably, that would be 2020 when the break clause is, uh, comes into to force in the current franchise agreement. First of all, we have no way of predicting what the quality of service will be in 2020. It is impossible to preempt whether or not the break clause should or should not be applied at that time. So deciding today that it should be applied in two years doesn't make any sense. Now, if the motion perhaps said it should be an option on the table, then perhaps I would have been more mindful to support it. Secondly, though, and this is the important point, nowhere in the Labour motion does it say who it thinks should run the uh, network in that instance. Now, they've said it, Colin Smith said it in his speech, it's no huge surprise to anyone in the chamber what their political view on this is. And there are many views, there are many views on who should or who could run the railway, but it doesn't say that in their motion. But third of all, uh, and that's that our amendment offers, I think, a sensible solution. Because when the break clause date approaches, the Scottish Government rightfully should come to this Parliament and outline its plan, explain to the Parliament its rationale for the decision that it wants to make, and explain that decision to us, including the cost implications 
of that decision. And that's what our amendment says. If it's very brief, I've got a lot to get through. Uh, it should be helpful to, to Mr Gooney ask who would run uh, the railways uh, uh, if that franchise was broken. It would be exactly the same position as happened with the UK government when they broke the East Coast mainline franchise. It would be run by an operator of last resort. And the important thing is that franchise would be announced now that it would be broken and we would have up until 2022 to put that operator into place. Jamie Green. Well, I, I'm, I'm very glad that, that Colin Smith has, has such confidence in the UK government. Unfortunately, I don't have the same confidence in this government that they could take over as operator of last resort. Yeah. E even if Abellio <laughs> decided to walk away from the contract, there's no evidence to suggest that a public uh, bid could, uh, could actually take over the running of, of the rail network. Um, can I move on, because we have such little time, to the SNP amendment? Because I think this is an important one today, and I want to bring it to members' attentions. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, I won't be supporting it. Why? Because it doesn't paint a true picture of the situation. Uh, it doesn't even acknowledge, it doesn't even acknowledge anywhere in the amendment that any of this is any of their fault. It's always someone else's fault. It was someone else's fault when we had the ferry debate last week. It's someone else's fault we're having a debate about rail this week. It's time after time that's the narrative that we get from this government. Their claim that majority of delays are network rail's fault is a very simplistic view at best, but actually factually misleading at worst. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at the facts. And we looked at this in great detail today in Rural Economy Committee. I hope you watched uh, that session, uh, Mr. Wheelhouse. You may have changed your amendment if you had. 37% uh, of delays on Scottish, uh, Scottish uh, Scott Rail Network are attributed to network rail infrastructure. That's not a majority, last time I checked. 23% of delays are attributed to train operator avoidable issues, such as carriage faults, or staffing issues. Nowhere in the motion does it accept that the network rail figure also includes weather-related delays, passengers taking ill, vandalism to the tracks and line, all of things that are outside of the control of any operator. In fact, Alex Hines himself told the committee this morning that all these uncontrollable factors are lumped into the network rail figure. So to use this 62% figure is disingenuous uh, completely. This fantastical I'm Mr. notion, Green must conclude that I'm uh, this fantastical this notion that devolution network rail will solve all those problems uh, is simply untrue. Presiding officer, members have three simple options. They can back a Labour motion that calls for an end to the franchise, but it doesn't say who will run it, how will run it, and how the much minister, it will cost. The member doesn't have time to have three options. Must conclude. Or they can back ours, which is a sensible uh, and pragmatic solution. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies for cutting everybody short, but there's just no time this afternoon. Uh, I'll call John Finney to be called. I know the member did take two interventions, but for, even with interventions, there's no time today. Uh, uh, John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, um, President Officer. Can I declare my membership of the RMT Parliamentary Group? And indeed, can I, I thank RMT members, ASLEF members, TSSA members, and all the other people who do a, a, an excellent job with our, uh, our, our real network. And I'm not certainly here to deride our... our um, ScotRail and their efforts. But what I am here to do is to discuss the, the motion that's in front of us, and that's a, a motion which is fundamental about political philosophy and, I think, political intent. And uh, Colin Smith's asked that the Scottish Government should exercise the break clause in the Scottish ScotRail franchise at the earliest opportunity, and that's certainly a position that the Scottish Green Party fully endorse. Uh, and uh, uh, we believe that public services should be run exclusively in the public interest. And of course, there's a statutory obligation placed in every limited company to maximise profits for its investors. And investors will always trump our citizens. Now, of course, Abellio isn't uh, a, a commercial company as such. It's part of the, the state-owned Dutch railways. Um, and uh, again, we're grateful to the RMT for research into uh, some of the finances and the questions of a loan from the parent company to the subsidiary, namely Abellio, and the 8% interest that's paid on that loan, and the assumption that there's no reason that that won't be repaid. Be um, um, and that rate of return, as the briefing tells us, it clearly outstrips the rail delivery group's claim of an average return of 2% for train companies. So um, I think there are questions to be asked and, and indeed um, worthy of further pursuit regarding that. Of course, the franchise mo model is uh, a Tory ruse to deliver public money to private companies, and that's compounded by the rolling stock leasing companies. But it's important we understand the past and future. There are some, it is certainly the case the Labour government could have and didn't um, change the arrangement. But I, I encourage sinners to repent, and I'm very happy at the position of the Scottish Labour Party. Now, uh, I'm also grateful to the ferret journalists for their research, a, a document that said the SNB could not have allowed public sector bid into ScotRail. So I think it's important that we have an informed debate about it. And that's not always the case with people. 
Um, but I'm also interested in, in something I took off the SNP website that says, how will the SNP use new powers over public sector rail franchises? And I quote, the, this power was secured by the SNP government. No, it wasn't. This power was delivered by the Smith Commission, and there were two other bodies on the Smith Commission that welcomed that, and that's an inaccurate statement that's repeated in the government's motion. Um, and it goes on to say, this year, this year, 2016, this year we will identify a suitable public body to make a robust bid for the next ScotRail franchise and will confirm the next three steps for preparation of a bid. We'll support the further devolution of network rail in Scotland so that it becomes fully accountable to the people of Scotland. The Scottish Green Party support that last bit, but the Scottish Green Party are very curious about the, the middle bit there um, and the progress that's been made. Because I have to tell you, it's probably unusual to say you were excited. I, I was excited about going to a meeting in 2016 with uh, other uh, representatives of the um, parliamentary groups and indeed the trade unions. And this was called by the then Cabinet Secretary um, and it followed a period of widespread criticism of ScotRail's performance. And he said the contract could be cancelled in 2020 and contingency plans were in place for the Scottish Government to take over train services earlier. Now, he, uh, the, he, he talked about the current performance then being unacceptable and current, confirmed Abelio could be stripped of the contract if uh, punctuality dipped. Well, I'm not a great one for figures because I, I think what people want to know is the train turns up. Percentages don't mean much to them. Um, and he went on to say, and I quote, if the Scottish Government, if Transport Scotland had to take over our railways tomorrow, we have contingency plans in place to do that. Now, these contingency plans presumably are still in place. So um, I, I think it's unfortunate that some of the amendments are in front of us here. I was very keen to have a, a detailed and longer than four minute discussion on this. But in the time that's left, I, I would say that Sadly, we can't nationalise our railways, but we can ensure that they run exclusively in the public interest. We've seen that with East Coast three times. It's simply about political will. And the question is, does the SNP have it? The Northern Isles contract uh, award would perhaps suggest not. But if they have it, can I ask how they're going to demonstrate it, please? Thank you. And I call Mike Rumbles. I'd ask all speakers to try and stick within four minutes, if possible. Presiding officer, I do believe that this debate today is an appropriate opportunity to prod the Scottish Government to act more appropriately over the poor performance of the ScotRail franchise operator to date. And I thank the Labour Party for bringing the subject forward in their own debating time. And the Liberal Democrats will be voting for their motion today if we get the chance. I know that the Transport Secretary has only been in post for a short time, but he takes over at a point when we are seeing the worst performance against agreed targets since the current franchise began. So I did feel sorry for Paul Wheelhouse, who tried to defend, in my view, the indefensible in the debate. So he has my sympathy. It is the customer experience which should be at the very heart of delivering an effective and efficient rail service. And I'm afraid that putting the customer first every time doesn't seem to me to be the priority of the current franchise operation. Whether it's delays to the service, skip stopping, which, by the way, I'm glad to hear this morning, has finally stopped as a policy by ScotRail. The ability of customers to actually obtain a seat on a train, well, there's a novelty. Or as reported in yesterday's newspapers, the very worst level of train cancellations at over 70, yes, 70 every day. That is, according to reports, three times higher than the first two years of the franchise. The overall customer experience is particularly poor. The record of the current franchise holder is simply not good enough. What has been the Scottish Government's reaction to this record of poor service to the Scottish rail traveller? Just last month, the new Transport Secretary granted a temporary waiver allowing ScotRail to breach previously agreed standards until June 2019. Just why he has done this is not clear, and I would have really liked him to have been in the chamber today to explain his reasoning to MSPs. It seems to be that the Transport Secretary, I would love to give away, but I, I only have less than two minutes. It seems to be that the Transport Secretary would rather blame Network Rail for the failings of the franchise operator. People will be angry that Scott Rail is given an easy ride just because SNP ministers have an intense desire to take control of Network Rail. I noticed that an unnamed Scottish Government spokesman said yesterday, and I quote, we know performance is not where it should be, and we heard that again today. That is why ministers can and do hold a Bailey or Scott Rail to account within the terms of the franchise, unquote. It doesn't seem to me or my Liberal Democrat colleagues 
that granting waivers to Abellio ScotRail over performance targets until June next year is quite what we would call holding the franchisee to account within the terms of the contract. No, rather than give waivers to Abellio ScotRail, the Scottish Government should be giving notice that it will be exercising the break clause in the contract at the earliest opportunity. The next franchise contract should be drawn up, learning the lessons of this current debacle and include stronger financial penalties and sanctions against poor performance in the interests of passengers. And in evidence to the committee this morning, Alex Hines, the managing director of ScotRail, confirmed after repeatedly refusing to answer questions in a straightforward manner that the Scottish Government had actually advanced funds to ScotRail ahead of when this money was actually due. Mr Hines, of course, wouldn't say how much public money was involved. Although I have to say, reading information from the Scotsman's website, they claim the figure is £23 million. Pounds. A £23 million pounds early payment. If that's not rewarding failure, I don't know what is. This lack of transparency by the Scottish Government over taxpayers' money is simply not acceptable. I said at the beginning of my contribution to this debate that focusing on the customer experience is paramount. I think the customer experience has been forgotten by ministers and it's about time they put this at the top of their agenda. Thank you. And I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Mason. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, it used to be skip stopping that upset my constituents. That was the practice deployed by ScotRail where they just missed out stops if they were running late. Sometimes there would be no notice. You could be standing at the door ready to get off only for the train to keep going and you end up miles away from home. And when skip stopping was ended, my constituents were delighted. Goodness me, I was even delighted. Now skip stopping of one or two stations has been replaced by trains skipping every single station stop because they've been cancelled completely. Scores of people have been in touch with me about delayed and cancelled trains. I signed up for the ScotRail alerts direct to my email account. The service has been so bad that the alerts have meant literally hundreds more emails clustering my inbox, 20 today alone for my local area. The delays have been going on for weeks, but they got much worse from the 22nd of October. Bond Hill Road Bridge was being replaced and this was a significant engineering undertaking, which unfortunately ran over. Morning rail services were all cancelled, but there was no contingency plan. It was nothing short of chaotic. Now, that accounted for half a day's disruption. It doesn't explain what followed, which was nine consecutive days of disruption. Trains cancelled, trains delayed, trains just randomly stopping before the end of the line. One such incident relayed to me was a train from Helensburgh to Edinburgh. It got far as Dalriach in Dumbarton. It waited there for an hour, doing nothing, and then it went backwards to Cardras before telling the 78 passengers to just get off. You couldn't make this up. Another constituent has just texted me to tell me that services from Stirling to Glasgow are cancelled right now. She doesn't know how she's going to get home on time. So it comes as no surprise to me to learn that the level of cancellations were the worst on record. But you know, these figures relate to the period up to the 13th of October. Let me make a prediction now. It's going to be much worse for the next accounting period if my local experience is anything to go by. Now, explaining to your employer that you were late because your train was cancelled or delayed is believable once or twice, but nine days in a row stretches credibility. The missed lectures, the missed hospital appointments, four hours to get to Glasgow when it normally takes 30 minutes. The funniest moment, and you need a sense of humour, presiding officer, to deal with this, was when I was told of Japanese tourists in Glasgow Central Station taking pictures of the display boards showing all the delays. They were doing this because it was clearly a novelty to them, because the trains in Japan run on time. And you know, when the trains do arrive, there are three carriages instead of six, and commuters get squeezed in like sardines because they're standing room only. But instead of standing up for passengers, the SNP government is running for the hills. SNP ministers relax ScotRail's performance targets. What happens? The service gets worse. SNP ministers give them more money. What happens? The service gets worse. SNP ministers allow them to raise prices. 
What happens, presiding officer? The service gets worse. When will the SNP wake up and understand that they need to be on the side of commuters? Frankly, my constituents have had enough. And can I suggest that ScotRail gives those who have experienced the most cancellations, the most delays, a refund? Not one that they need to apply to after the event, but by offering half price travel now up to Christmas from Helensburgh, from Balloch, from Dumbarton, and in every other area affected. And you know, if they can't make the service demonstrably better in the next few weeks, then it's time for the franchise to end. John Mason to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Now, I think we can start by saying that we have an extremely good rail network in this country. I have travelled by train in a number of European countries, and the networks in cities like Athens or Rome are much poorer than Glasgow, while our rolling stock is clearly much better than some in Lisbon and St Petersburg. So yes, our railways do face challenges, but let's keep it in perspective. Especially in Glasgow, when you combine the 59 train stations and the 15 subway stations, we have a total of 74 rail stations. My favourite means of transport is rail, which is why I head up the cross-party group on rail. And on Saturday, I decided I would do all my travelling by rail and left the car at home. So I used the train five times and the subway twice. That included a conference in the morning, shopping in the city centre, football in the afternoon, a concert in the evening, and I got home. All seven eight were excellent services. All seven ran on time. In my own constituency, we now have direct links to Edinburgh, thanks to the very successful Airdrie Bathgate re line reopened under the SNP. The electrification of the Whifflet line means more destinations from stations in my constituency eh, through central low level and to other stations. So now all 11 stations in my constituency are electrified. We recently got a new eh, road bridge over the railway at eh, Bailison, which has greatly improved local traffic. Now, it's true to say that while that electrification was going on in my constituency, I got complaints about the noise of pile driving at night. And while the bridge was being replaced, local buses were diverted and people were not happy. But it seems to me that both locally and nationally, if we are serious about our railways and we're going to invest to improve them for the future, it is inevitable that there will be temporary disruption, temporary delays and temporary cancellations. ScotRail does have delays and cancellations, but many are out with its control, as we've heard. Overall, I think it gives a good service. A recent REC a committee a meeting heard from one academic that we should realise how good ScotRail is compared with Northern Rail. So I looked at the PPM figures. Arrivals within five minutes in October, ScotRail 81.2%, Northern 74.3%. September, ScotRail 86.3%, Northern 82.8%. August, ScotRail 90.6%, Northern 82.2%. In February, I was down in Cardiff for a city break. Now, some of the trains down there, I think you could describe as quite quaint, like the one coach one that goes to Cardiff Bay, but I reckon they would just love to have a system more like ours. So while of course we want improvements, maybe we should be positive about some of the good things that we have. On the question of public ownership, uh, no, if Labour want a full debate, they should give us a proper two hours and not one hour, ten minutes. On the question of public ownership, I'm keen on that in principle. We should not have sold off gas or electricity or public transport. And in an ideal world, I would be up for a return to public ownership. However, I do not think ownership is the only factor. At that same REC committee the other week, Lothian buses, who are widely admired, told the REC committee that it would make no difference whether they were privately or publicly owned. As I said, I do favour public ownership and it should be possible to make public sector efficient and customer focused. However, there are risks with public ownership. Politicians can be scared of making difficult decisions. There is a temptation to keep making subsidies and that's what happened during my lifetime in the past. And I remember when we had corporation buses in Glasgow and there were still disputes and complaints that one area was favoured over another. Similarly, I remember British Rail and it did not always have a great reputation. They were not seen to be customer focused or ambitious in any way and their food offering was the butt of many jokes. Again, network rail is publicly owned but appears to be the cause of a lot of the delays and cancellations. As others have said, and according to the briefing from Abellio, 62% of delay minutes in 1819 are network rail responsibility, 28% are Scott rails. 
Now, looking forward, we expect to increase uh, by 10 per cent daily services Time, by the please, end Mr. of Mason. 2019. Uh, so, in conclusion, let us be clear of the reasons for the problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. No one could pretend that Scotland's rail system does not have significant challenges. It does, and Jamie Green was right to call out the SNP amendment for its naivety and standard buck-passing. The Labour's solution is to strip the railway's operation from the incumbent franchisee and nationalise the railway. Colin Smith stated that the reason for this was because passengers were fed up with overcrowded, overpriced and unreliable trains. No doubt. But let's test whether these are solved by the proposal for public ownership. Mr Smith says the trains are overcrowded. That's true in the central belt and at certain very specific times of the day. So what is the solution? Well, you could put on more rolling stock to make longer sets, but Labour seem to have forgotten, or perhaps they're not aware, that ScotRail's fleet is entirely leased, almost exclusively from three main rolling stock companies. So even if the current platforms could accommodate the larger sets, at what cost to rent more kit? And is that kit even available? So maybe you could just run more trains at those specific times. But where do you get track capacity on a system that is pretty much sweated to capacity? The East Coast Main Line has no available space, and Glasgow Central could not handle more or longer trains without significant infrastructure investment. And again, more sets means more rolling stock, means more leasing costs to the taxpayer. Now, I suppose this nationalised company could buy the rolling stock to run the services, as I think John Finney might have been driving at, but at what cost? And if it's not going to do that, you are just running the exact same model, in which case change of ownership has failed to solve the problem of overcrowding. So how about this idea that the break clause should be exercised because tickets are overpriced? Well, let's assume, because I'm trying to be kind here, that Colin Smith can solve his overcrowding without increasing the rolling stock, so the running cost is the same. So how does your new public owner get the price down? Three basic ways. Hike taxes and hypothecate them to the railway, cannibalise from another budget such as health and education, or cut investment. I'd be interested to hear in closing if the first two are on the cards, but assuming not, Labour appear not to know that the margin on running a railway is only around 2 to 3%. This is a less and less attractive... Uh, will I have time, presiding officer? You won't get it back. I won't get it back. I'm very sorry, Mr Finney perhaps later. Uh, but finally, so in brief, change of ownership will not deliver the price reductions that the member seeks. And finally, we hear it is unreliable. It's a fair point. Passengers are rightly angry about cancellations, delays and breakdowns. But Labour proposes to address that by exercising a break clause and having a nationalised operator. Except that a significant reason underlying the delays and cancellations last year was Storm Alley. And on performance failures, ScotRail suggests that issues with infrastructure, which is the responsibility of the publicly owned network rail, account for about 37%. And just how would a nationalised company fix an engine or a set any more quickly than any other company? So unless Labour really proposes to run trains in unsafe conditions in a storm, the fact is, a publicly owned company would have exactly the same reliability figures, it would have exactly the same issues of overcrowding, and it would have exactly the same pricing constraints. So by all means, propose a break clause. But Labour have got to do better than simply leave what happens next hanging and demand nationalisation without even being brave enough to put it in their motion. Because we should focus on the positive interventions that would actually make a difference to Scotland's railway, as the amendment in the name of Jamie Green does. And we should demand the SNP should stop with the excuses in theirs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Claire Baker to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. And I'm pleased for the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. I've been raising the concerns of my constituents over the performance of ScotRail in this chamber for many months, and I'm glad that it is a Labour debate that is providing the time to say that enough is enough and it's time for radical change on our railways. It was an interesting contribution from John Mason, MSP from Glasgow, but I'm disappointed that no SNP members from Fife are contributing today because they will be contacted by the same constituents who regularly contact me with complaints about our train service. And they, the same as me, will see week in, week out social media frustration that commuters have with the service. 
The Fife Cir Circle is an important service for people who are working, socialising and studying in Edinburgh, and it's an important route if you are travelling onwards and need to make connections. This is a service which I've had complaints about cancellations, delays, skipping stations, overcrowding and ticket prices for over a year. I have tried to be constructive and find solutions for my constituents. Earlier this year, I held a Facebook live chat with ScotRail senior management at their head office, putting my constituents' questions to them on overcrowding, cancellations, delays and station skipping. I do appreciate ScotRail agreed to take part in this discussion and following complaints that I raised, I recognised that progress was made on reducing stop skipping, which had been rife. But the other promises made haven't been delivered on. The Minister says we're on the cusp of change, but passengers in Fife have been putting up with overcrowding and the Crush Hour campaign from Dunfermline Press has been highlighting this uncomfortable and stressful experience. This is hugely disappointing and frustrating for commuters who are continuing to pay significant sums of money and portion of their income for public transport. In a move that could be seen to emolliate commuters, a Fife Fiver fare was temporarily introduced. I don't begrudge anyone who took benefit of it, but it only applied at times more limited than off-peak and so didn't compensate the commuters who'd been experiencing the greatest difficulties. I regularly ask ScotRail for performance figures. The published figures disguise the true experience of commuters who are travelling at peak times. By focusing on figures for peak times, I know that over 100 peak time Fife Circle services heading to Edinburgh in the morning and coming from Edinburgh in the evening were cancelled between April and September this year. In recent, works, the reports, sorry, in recent weeks, the reports from constituents on social media suggest this quarter's figures will be worse. In recent weeks, it's become increasingly unreliable, with people stranded at stations, often in the cold and in the dark, and no replacement bus services have been provided. Trains in Fife are now frequently cancelled, with crew issues being given as the cause. This is not good enough and it's an unfair reflection on the hard work of ScotRail employees and ScotRail need to urgently resolve the ongoing industrial dispute. Aside from the inconvenience of cancelled and delayed trains, there are consequences for my constituents. People are late for work, not always with sympathetic employers. Families are late collecting their children from childcare, resulting in fines and fees. People are now taking the decision to change their travel arrangements, leading to more people wanting to park in Inverkeaden and Kirkcaldy, where there are more trains, but not enough capacity for parking. These decisions also increase our carbon footprint because people are no longer confident of using their local train station and are driving short distances to the bigger stations with multiple trains. It feels as if five commuters are being shortchanged, and I know many feel they are receiving a second-class service compared to other parts of the central belt. But what does the government do when ScotRail is performing poorly and letting down passengers? It lowers the target and it waves away the consequences. In opening this debate, Colin Smith set out how we can take different steps to do this better, to create rail services that put passengers before profits and to end the current contract sooner rather than later and bring our trains back into public ownership. Let's agree to do that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Railways require serious scrutiny, yet this afternoon's debate is an exercise in rank hypocrisy from Labour, which was in power for 13 years from 1997 and made no effort whatsoever to return the railways to public ownership. When Abellio won the ScotRail contract in 2014, Labour insisted that the SNP government decided not to include a public sector bid for the service. However, under UK legislation, the Scottish Government did not have the power to make such a decision when the 2013 draft franchise was tendered. We have always opposed restrictions preventing public sector bids for the ScotRail franchise with our 2015 Westminster election manifesto stating, we believe that the public sector organisation should be able to bid to operate rail services as allowed in EU law but currently prevented by UK legislation. A 2016 manifesto to this Parliament also pledged to ensure a public sector bid for future rail franchises. I'm not sure which part of that statement is confusing to Labour or indeed the Greens, but let me be clear. It was pressure for SNP MPs which led to the power to allow public sector bids for rail franchises being included in the Scotland 2016 Act. Once again, Labour is calling the Scottish Government to do something that time and again they've proven themselves unwilling to do. When the Railways Bill, which was sliced up British Rail into over 100 separate companies, was published in 1993, Labour pledged to renationalise the railways upon returning to office. Yet Tony Blair and his colleagues made no attempt to deliver this promise. 
But why dwell on the past? We can see that Labour is do what, what Labour is doing right now in Wales. In clear contradiction of their 2016 Welsh Assembly manifesto, Labour awarded the Wales and Borders Rail franchise to a joint venture by French operator Keolis and Spanish-owned Amy. And Mick Cash, General Secretary of the RMT, said, and I quote, the RMT is appalled and angry that a Labour administration in Wales would even consider a proposal that mirrors the failed public-private partnership on London Underground, which collapsed in total chaos. And I understand that Mr uh, uh, Bibby was muttering for a minute or two there, so I'm happy to take an intervention. Yeah, if Bibby. he can explain exactly why Labour broke its promise for 13 consecutive years to renationalise the railways and why we should believe you now. Neil Bibby. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Mr. Bibby, your microphone is not on, Mr. Bibby. Oh. Thanks. Sorry, back to Mr. Gibson. Mr. Gibson. And cancellations experienced by many rail users across Scotland. However, Scotland is amongst the best performing rail operators in the UK. Let me turn to what Richard Clinic says in this month's Rail Magazine, and I quote when he looks at what's happening in England. The answer to the mess, run the railways like in Scotland, where tracking trains of one managing director and government decisions are made with customers at heart and by those who know the railways. Problems are tackled head on and usually dealt with quickly. There may be short-term pain, but the result is long-term gain. Now, constituents travelling from my, uh, from my constituency in North Ayrshire have already benefited from significant Scottish Government investment, which has delivered new and additional train services, new rolling stock, investment in stations, including a 50% increase in services with greater connectivity between North Ayrshire's towns, new Class 380 rolling stock, improving passenger comfort with spacious seating, wide aisles, air conditioning, power sockets, laptops, luggage provision, space for cycles, wheelchairs, more park and ride, better waiting facilities, additional CCTV for upgrades. They hate listening to good news. New customer information screens, longer platforms, platform validators for smart cars, cycle parking, all of which improve overall passenger experience and there is 28% more rolling stock. The SNP government cannot rest and it is committed to uh, greater improvements and spends twice what the UK government does per capita on rail services, showing its commitment. Time, and Mr. Gibson. Just to finish, Presiding Officer, Scott Rail Alex, uh, Alex Hines said today to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee that, that, that uh, cross-border services delays increased by 80% last year as a result of the shambles caused by Govia Thameslink and Northern Railway down south. I wonder if Labour in summing up will explain how barely a Scott Rail uh, can actually impact upon that. What we Thank need you. is a reliable train Gibson. service. Uh, uh, people are not interested in who is to blame, and that's oh. where our focus should lie. Mr. Improving Gibson, services you. for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Point of order, Edward Mountain. Uh, uh, presiding officer, thank you for taking a point of order. I, I, re I really think that if members are going to quote what they heard at the REC committee this morning, they would be best to quote what was actually said, not what they want here. And the quote that 80% of the delays in Scotland are due to cross-border services alone is fundamentally not true. And therefore, the member has misled Parliament. And I wonder if he would care to reconsider what he has just said, because it is not what we were told this morning at the committee. Thank you. No, no, Mr Gibson, please sit down. Mr Gibson, please sit down. Mr Gibson, please sit down for a second. I'm not... Mr Gibson, we're not having a debate through the chair about this. It's a point of order for me. The point of order is not a point of order. It's a point of debate, which the member has made. However, let's not e extend this point. So I'll call Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. I just wish that Labour had made this debate a little bit longer, considering the passion that is being felt in this chamber today. Scottish uh, commuters and passengers expect a reliable rail service. It's, it's got to be punctual, punctual, efficient and deliver value for money. And the picture today that we're all hearing could not be further from that. We all agree that performance of ScotRail in the past year has fallen well below expectation, as constituents regularly inform me. In fact, it's fallen to its lowest in 20 years. It's not only my constituents lambasting ScotRail, it is a, a Scotland-wide problem. And whilst the Borders Rail has been a conduit for travel beyond my constituency of Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire, opening up the area to the rest of the railway network, it has not been straightforward and simple. 
Whilst things are improving, the Borders Rail here has been plagued with stop skipping, late trains, cancellations and a lack of adequate ticket purchasing machines on the platform. This is perfectly demonstrated by the fact that more than half of Borders Railway trains arrive late at Tweed Bank. And frankly, this is not good enough. And it's not going unnoticed. I get loads of emails and letters from my constituents complaining about the poor service they've experienced on this line. And reliability is only one example of the litany of failures. Winter resilience on this line is also paramount, given the geography and the rural nature of the line. We need more robust measures in place to ensure that we have a reliable service during those winter months. Blaming others or leaves just does not help. To top all this off, should the train to Tweed Bank be cancelled from Edinburgh, there are very few alternatives in the way of reaching my part of the borders, leaving borderers stranded in the capital. And rolling stock has been less than satisfactory with cold, substandard trains and commuters complaining of lack of carriages at peak times. The refurbished rolling stock has been promised um, by the December 2018 timetable change, but it's not before time. And all these factors considered, the Borders Railway falls well short of the high standards that we do expect from a modern day service. Performance and standards should be constantly scrutinised and monitored. And many are rightfully concerned about the trajectory ScotRail are tra uh, currently travelling on. Recently, Michael Matheson gave ScotRail a free pass by granting a ministerial waiver on standards and agreeing not to enforce compliance breaches against Abellio until June 2019. He did not inform pa Parliament of this, and shifting the goalposts is unacceptable to my constituents. Moreover, the economic um, impact of poor performance is stark, and train delays cost the Scottish economy up to £233,000 a day. Poor performance is just not helping local businesses and individuals. And let me be unequivocal. We are not calling for nationalisation, as the Labour motion suggests, or they're talking about. We want greater transparency and accountability, and accountability to passengers and staff is what is absolutely crucial. These benches believe a public sector operator taking control of ScotRail franchise will shift huge risk, potentially costing taxpayers millions of pounds. And this increased, this increased risk, I understand the cost at the moment, and there are obviously uh, fines to be paid, and that is our cost as well to the taxpayer, but we don't know, there's been no cost analysis done of this, and that is why probably it's not specifically mentioned in your motion. And Scotland needs a competitive structure for the railways, we all know that, um, which offers affordable fees and a quality service. However, we shouldn't rush into simplistic solutions, well it's not really simplistic, but um, hurried solutions as a temporary remedy um, like Labour are suggesting. Um, it might deliver even poorer results, it might cost, as I said, the taxpayer dearly. I cannot help but mention um, we have had so many false promises um, from the SNP government and I, I just want to ask uh, Paul Wheelhouse, uh, perhaps in his closing he could, he could uh, point to this, but did Councillor Par Parker mention his disappointment about the investment uh, and the delay in the reinstatement at East Linton and Reston Station, which would serve Berwickshire greatly? James Hamilton. I'll, I will close there. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, and I'm afraid uh, every member, I think, or nearly every member, has gone over time. Just slightly, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever, points of order. The cumulative effect has been that, I'm afraid, Stuart Macmillan, we will not be able to hear your contribution. I recognise that's not very fair. However, I have little choice. We'll move to closing speeches. Edward Mountain, first of all, for consideration. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think this has been an interesting afternoon. Not a debate, just a statement of political positions. And for that, I think we have done Scotland down. Let me be clear, I think that the public don't want politics on trains, they want trains that are reliable, trains that run on time, and I don't really believe they care at this stage who runs them, providing they turn up when they say they're going to be turned up, they're clean and tidy and they work. Now this government this afternoon has tried to use this debate to promote a form of nationalism. Give us control over network rail and everything will be better. Well, there's no evidence that that assertion is correct, but probably it sounds good and allows a bit of flag waving. The Labour Party have hidden behind their calls for demanding the end of a break clause to be triggered without saying what they would do when that break clause is tri triggered. To me, that is a true political answer, not bold enough to say what they really think, which, let's be clear, some of their members spoke about, which is nationalism. Well, sorry, nationalisation. So... Well, the position is the same. 
One, is, one wants nationalism, the other wants nationalisation. So SNP and Labour, SNP and Labour have given two op options. And let me tell you, neither of them will make the trains run on time. What we need is another option, which is proposed by this party, and that is effective management. Now, no, I'm sorry, I will not take interventions this afternoon. No one else have, and I don't have time. So, if the SNP believe that after being in charge of the railways for 10 years, that this is the best they can do, I don't believe it's good enough. And when the break clause is to be triggered, let's discuss it. Let's not prejudice it now. Let's determine then if ScotRail has measured up. Now, I did have the opportunity to go through a whole list of speakers this afternoon, and, and, and frankly, they're just political points. I, I, I mean, you know, one person said, don't worry, everything's going to be all right. Another one said it's all Labour's fault. The next one said it was all about overcrowding and ticket prices. Frankly, it doesn't get us anywhere, and I know we're short of time. Presiding officer, I don't believe today's debate has done this Parliament credit, but it's certainly not easy listening for this MP government, and nor should it. They have been in charge for 11 years. Under the SNP, the performance of ScotRail is getting worse and worse, year after year. Today we have heard how they have made contract payments early. Strange message to tell the general public that we don't get trains to run on time, but what we'll do is we'll play the contractor early. I don't think that's anything to be proud of. What sort of message does it send to the public who travel by rail and pay for a service that they don't get? Now, as for Labour's idea, I just want to say that to break the contract and then nationalise the industry, I have a very clear message for you. I don't think anyone believes that nationalisation is going to work. And Liam Kerr gave a very good reason why it's just not as easy as that. I don't think uh, we, we are clear in what we should be saying, and I want to make it clear what this party is saying. And that is that we expect Scott Rail and the Scott Rail Alliance to be held to account by the government who should show management and leadership, which clearly they are not doing at the moment. The patience of rail travellers in Scotland is not without limit. And we believe that you both have got to end, end up your game, because if you don't, when it comes to renewing both of your contracts, the Scottish public will give you a fairly stern warning that what you've done is not good enough. Thank you. I call Paul Wheelhouse to close with the government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have had a lively debate, clearly, um, and I, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, there has been a frustrating experience for many passengers. I, I take entirely at face value what Claire Baker was saying and certainly good engagement with her local constituents and uh, clearly uh, the government listens to these, these matters. But our railways do play a crucial role in connecting our communities, enabling opportunities and spreading sustainable economic prosperity across the country. However, you would be forgiven for thinking uh, that ScotRail, you know, forgetting that ScotRail is actually the uh, best performing large train operator in the UK even now and performing above the GB average. Indeed, Mr Mountain in his closing remarks might want to reflect on the fact that GB performance has been getting worse year after year and he doesn't seem to allocate any blame to UK government. I'm sorry I have not time. I wish I could, uh, Mr McNeil, but... As, as I set out my opening remarks, through the government's in record investment, we are seeing the first steps towards delivering transformational change across the country, reducing uh, the rail's carbon footprint, delivering more trains, uh, new trains, an exciting intercity product that delivers what passengers want when travelling between our seven cities, more services and more seats for passengers, including, and it's important to stress the point I made earlier, uh, rollout of rolling stock in Fife, in, in uh, the borders, in Glasgow, in Verclyde, uh, for Mr McMillan's benefit, feedback on the quality of travel experience on the new electric Hitachi trains and the recently introduced refurbished high-speed trains has been uh, extremely encouraging. And once uh, more are in service, we'll see existing refurbished trains moved across the country to help provide more capacity. Transform Scotland goes far as to stay on their website. ScotRail franchise is delivering the largest tranche of improvements of the railway in Scotland, living memory. Many of the improvements happening now, new electric trains between Edinburgh and Glasgow, proper intercity trains, improvements to rural services, and a whole host of timetable improvements are all key demands Transform Scotland had for this franchise. This government will continue to work closely with ScotRail and their train suppliers and manufacturers to ensure requirements are delivered during 2019 and all parties are clear on our disappointment that the delays in introduction of the new trains into Scotland are unacceptable. 
I should emphasise that at the start of the contract, we've ensured that both the new electric and refurbished high-speed trains have protected contractual rights to remain in Scotland beyond the life of this contract and unlock long-term value. That, this is an important point because it means it provides us with the ability to stabilise our Scottish fleet and not be at the mercy of the UK government model of franchising, which has seen some of our diesel fleet in Scotland depart the country to serve contractual commitments elsewhere. We recognise that performance is not where it should be, and the system-wide Donovan recommendations designed to improve performance on a sustainable basis must be the primary area of focus for both Network Rail and ScotRail. It should be recognised that a significant uh, proportion of ScotRail's performance over this year has been directly impacted by the increase in Network Rail's infrastructure failures. That is the reason why we have provided assistance to ScotRail. I'm happy to discuss that further with other members that have raised that. But the account, currently Network Rail's uh, disruption counts for 63% uh, of the disruption since the start of the financial year. We do recognise there have been unprecedented weather and the cross-border timetable issues that have been raised uh, in England, all of which is out with ScotRail's direct control. And Colin Smith and, and his colleagues do the public a disservice if they don't recognise that. I set out our position clearly on the sensible rationale to devolve essential railway functions to Scotland, increasing local focus and accountability, and to increase the ability of Scotland's railways to perform at their best for passengers and businesses alike. Paul Tetlaw of Transform Scotland also stated, it's now widely acknowledged that the separation of infrastructure from the operation of the trains was a serious mistake, and so the creation of ScotRail Alliance is clearly the right approach and puts Scotland ahead of most of the UK. I'm sorry, I do not have time. Um, we believe that through its recently announced rail review, the UK government has an opportunity to deliver the full devolution of rail to enable the Scottish government to structure our railways to meet Scotland's needs, and it's only right that Network Rail becomes more accountable for this. This Parliament has secured the powers to allow public sector bodies uh, to bid for future Scottish Rail franchises, something the Labour Party resisted when it was in office. Alongside our commitment, I repeat that this should be accompanied by a fully devolved infrastructure manager accountable to this Parliament. We are committed to the success of the ScotRail franchise and look forward to working with our delivery partners to deliver a resilient and reliable railway for Scotland's rail passengers. I, I commend our amendment to the Chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call on Colin Smith to close uh, for the Labour Party and to wind up the debate. Thank you, President Officer. Today's debate has laid bare the failure at the heart of Scotland's railways and the complete lack of answers from the Scottish Government. Speaker, speaker after speaker has exposed the way the Abelio Scott Rail franchise is letting down Scotland's rail passengers. Jackie Bailey highlighted the utter chaos and disruption faced by passengers in Dumbarton. And Claire Baker revealed the misery being faced by Fife's commuters who are receiving a second-class citizen service, both standing up for their constituents and Scotland's rail passengers. What a contrast to SNP MSPs. Jackie Bailey and Claire Baker highlighted the real-life examples that bring home the scale of failure. They graphically illustrate the reality that performance is lower in every measure than at any point in this franchise. Re reliability is the worst on record. Punctuality targets haven't been hit since 2015, and now they are below the franchise breach level. The Minister showed today that he either doesn't know or won't say when ScotRail will hit those targets again, although the Office of Rail and Road tell us uh, we will have to wait until 2022. And failing to deliver on performance, ScotRail have racked up almost £10.5 million of fines, and rail passengers are being asked to pay the price of that failure, with rising fares for trains that are less punctual, more unreliable and more overcrowded. Yet, instead of holding ScotRail to account, the Scottish Government are letting them off the hook, striking secret deals, giving them a licence to fail on their franchise responsibilities. And today, we have heard that the Government clearly intends to continue to let ScotRail fail, to let this franchise run until 2025. President officer, extending the franchise beyond 2022 should not be a given. It needs to be earned. Yet everybody except it seems the SNP and Tories believe Abelio have failed to earn that right. Instead of accepting this failure today, SNP, MSP after MSP have rehashed their rehearsed excuses for failure. It's all the fault of Network Rail. It's cross-border services, Kenny Gibson tells us. It would be easy for me to repeat the point made by Jamie Green that disruption caused by extreme weather is attributed to Network Rail, not Scott Rail, skewing the disruption figures, or that Transport Scotland say that failures caused by incidents outside Scotland only actually reduced Scott Rail's overall performance by 0.2 per cent at a time Scott Rail are nearly 5 per cent below target, despite the misleading contribution of Kenny Gibson. But I'm not one going second, to Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, just I'm one second. Can we keep the conversations down, please, Mr. Smith?
I'm not going to defend the failings of Network Rail or the cross-border privatised rail companies. Both are remnants of the current fragmented rail system that I want to see end. Labour's position is clear. We need to bring both those who run our tracks and those who run our trails together as one under public ownership. And what Kenny Gibson and other SNP MSPs didn't say when it comes to performance is that one of the key causes for disruption, one of the reasons given by ScotRail for plummeting performance and their application to have their performance targets waived is the fact they no longer routinely skip stops. In other words, ScotRail can't hit their targets because they're doing... Sorry, I don't have time, unfortunately. But ScotRail can't hit their targets, they say, because they're doing what every passenger expects them to do, stop at the stations they are supposed to. Oh. Kenny Gibson also, Kenny Gibson also as, as SNP MSPs often do when they can't defend their own government, decided to talk about Wales. He claimed the Welsh Government, he claimed, he claimed, he claimed that the Welsh Government, he claimed that the Welsh Government chose, he claimed that the Welsh Government chose to award the Wales and Borders franchise to a private operator rather than taking it into public hands. But what Kenny Gibson didn't tell us, probably because frankly he doesn't know, is that is that the Welsh Government do not have the power to set up a public sector bid. Despite... No. And despite, despite re repeated calls from the Labour-led Welsh Government, they do not have the same exemption that we have here in Scotland. But frankly, I can assure Kenny Gibson, who is more concerned about the plans of the Welsh Government than his own Government, Welsh Labour will continue to push for these powers. More importantly, more importantly, the Welsh Labour Party, the Scottish Labour Party, the UK Labour Party will continue to push for full nationalisation of our railways. What a shame, what a shame the SNP refused to join us in that campaign. No. Mike Rumbles. Mike Rumbles highlighted that the Scottish Government are handing out advance payments to Bilio because failing performance means they are not making as much cash as they expected. I wonder what the government's response would be if our nurses or doctors or teachers all asked for next year's salary to be brought forward. And the financial difficulties faced the franchise are also revealed by the, the contribution of John Finney, who, who exposed the fact that loans are being given to the company with interest rates of 8%, ensuring that they make a tidy profit in loan repayments at the Scottish taxpayers' expense. President officer, enough is enough. It's time to put an end to Scotland's rip-off railways. We need to end the private rail franchises at the earliest opportunities and bring them under public ownership. This isn't a return to some 20th century model of nationalisation, as the Tories will have us believe, but a modern 21st century vision of public democratic ownership that puts passengers first, not profits first. It's a vision where workforces will be the managers of change, not its casualties, where public services serve the people, not the profiteers, and where we have a joined-up transport system that helps our economy, not hinders it. Today, this parliament can get on board with that vision. We can tell the SNP to stop acting as cheerleaders for failed Tory privatisation, and we can unite to fight for a railway system that delivers from passengers, not from the profiteers. Thank you. That concludes our debate on the ScotRail break clause. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14761 in the name of Graham Day uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to tomorrow's business. Does any member wish to speak against this motion? No one does. Could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. And the question is that motion 14761 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is Business Motion 14738 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. And could I call on Graeme Day to move the motion? Move, President. Thank you. No one has asked to speak on the motion. The question is that Motion 14738 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Business Motion 14739 on the Stage 1 timetable for a bill. Does anyone wish to speak against this motion? No one does. Could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Move, President. Thank you very much. The question is that motion 14739 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 14740 on the approval of an SSI and 14741 on a committee meeting at the same time as a meeting of the Parliament? Move, President. Thank you very much. And those ones will be taken at decision time to which we now come. So the first question this evening is that Amendment 147171.3 in the name of Jean Freeman 
which seeks to amend motion 14717 in the name of Alex Rowley on investing in social care for Scotland's future be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to motion, a uh, division, sorry, and we'll cast our votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14717.3 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 92, no 28. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 14717.1 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alex Rowley, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 14717 in the name of Alex Rowley, as amended, on investing in social care for Scotland's future be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on motion 14717 in the name of Alex Rowley as amended is yes 91, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Move on to the next uh, amendment. I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Paul Wheelhouse is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Jamie Green will fall. The next question is that amendment 14720.3 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse, which seeks to amend motion 14720 in the name of Colin Smith, on the Scott Rail Break Clause be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14720.3 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse is yes 60, no 60. There were no abstentions. And as the result is tied, uh, I will cast my vote against the amendment and therefore the amendment falls. So the next question is the amendment 14720.2 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Colin Smith on the Scott Rail Break Clause. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division again and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14720.2 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 27, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 14720 in the name of Colin Smith on the Scott Rail Break Clause be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 14720 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 34, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 14740 in the name of Graham D on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah, we are agreed. The final question is that motion 14741 in the name of Graham D on a committee meeting at the same time as Parliament be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move on now to members' business in the name of Maurice Golden on the special report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>